Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to our April nonprofit series um, focusing on tips from the field based on what we typically see when assisting companies to purchase technology solutions for your organization. The goal of the presentation today is to help you navigate those contract negotiations and to help you spot uh, issues and risks to consider, which there are plenty. On behalf of the whole Benable family, I hope you and yours are all well, staying healthy. It is great to see so many of us gathered today despite the work at home challenges and, and our new normal. My name is Nora Garrote, and with me today is my colleague, Chris Kim. We are both part of the IT and technology transactions practice team at Venable. We have a lot of content for you today, and you will be receiving the slide deck after the presentation today, which includes additional material at the end uh, to provide you a lot more detail on some, on some of the key items and issues that, uh, that we're going to be discussing for you. Um, first of all, um, we want to provide you some context. Um, the focus today is when you and your nonprofit are buying a technology solution. Um, so you're going to be the customer. And the other party will be a vendor, a licensed or a service provider. Um, and the slide that we're seeing now shows you some of the flavors for these types of transactions. Uh, there are three basic buckets and many, many hybrids in between. You've got development solutions, you've got license solutions, and you have service-based solutions. Uh, what we're talking about is, is things like you contracting for, for example, functional software or systems, right? You may need an HR system, payroll system, financial management system, email, contract management, donor or member management system, CRM like uh, Salesforce. Uh, you may also be contracting for things that we call platforms. Um, these are things like portals for your members to come in and do specific things. These are marketing platforms uh, where you may be able to do uh, to have a data warehouse and do uh, analytics. It also relates to things like apps and websites, but it also relates when you're procuring, which is very common today. Uh, things that may not be uh, really that much user-facing, right? Things like network or back-end functions. A lot of people today procure server capacity, uh, storage capacity, um, backup security, and network monitoring that they're all procure as services. Uh, so we're focusing on procurements of a material monetary value, not downloadable soft software when you go online, and also not the ones that come in a disk in a box right from the store. Um, those terms are not going to be negotiable. So our first goal today is to make sure that you understand what type of procurement it is that you're undertaking, so you will end up with the right contract terms. And you understand the actual applicable commercial risk. Uh, many times we're asked um, by, our, by our customer to help them with a contract, for example. They say, oh, it's for a hosted and a cloud solution. And, um, and we realize that some folks in the organization think they're buying software that they're going to get and they're going to pay for, and they're going to keep forever, right? So right now you see there's a disconnect on what the vendor is actually selling and what they're thinking they're buying. And um, many other times a client thinks, oh, because I pay for something, I must own it, and I can do whatever I want with it, right, which is hardly ever the case. So suddenly when you don't understand the vendor's uh, selling uh, parameters and the scope of what you budget it for, right, uh, you're going to find the value uh, that you thought you were getting from this technology investment is going to be reduced. And it is very possible that the solution that you're looking at, um, it's not going to meet your, your needs. Um, the next thing we wanted to, check, uh, to set the level playing field on is that to clear some mis misconceptions. Um, 
the we hear a lot like okay can you spend an hour on this i mean this is a standard contract and you're spending a million dollars or two right uh um good news and bad news is that there really is no standard contract or standard terms um the only one with a standard contract is your vendor your service provider they will have a contract that will give it to you and without exception it will not be favorable to you um uh, not only will it have terms that are on their face, not uh, market or what you're looking for, but it will also be missing a lot of important things. That's where we find we're bringing a lot of the value recently to our clients. Uh, things like data security commitments, service level obligations, caps on pricing, firm rights to renew, service level commitments, all of that you sort of many times need to ask for and they will be there but but they're not offered initially so you need to figure out what terms you're missing and not just react to what you see um, the vendor is likely not going to want to use your contact contract template um, it's another misconception so i'm going to send them something over uh, they're not going to do that unless you're spending a real uh, big amount of money with them and uh, many times, in fact, uh, you're probably not helping yourself because the template you have may not be the right one, right? Uh, you may have an independent contractor agreement, but it's not really designed to be used for a cloud solution. Uh, so in and of itself, what you're asking the vendor to give you is going to be incomplete. Um, the other thing that we see is that templates that originally were created for the right thing but you haven't updated, the customer hasn't updated in a number of years. So it doesn't reflect really what the market terms are today or the current legal, uh, legal or regulatory environment. So as a result, I mean, you ought to assume that you will likely be negotiating using the, uh, uh, the, vendor's, um, the vendor's contract. And there's nothing, nothing wrong with that. Another uh, misconception that we see all the time is that uh, people think the contract will protect you. So you go from finding out your vendor, thinking you, it's affordable, you can do it, and then going straight to the contract. Um, a big trend today, in today's environment, um, where there is so much risk associated with working with data, particular data that's personal or, or sensitive, um, in places like the U.S. where litigation is rampant, right? Um, regulators are also keeping a very close eye on the tech providers. Um, you ought to assume that no vendor um, or contract will protect you fully. And in many cases, they will not even protect you reasonably. Uh, and the idea is you want to find this out as soon as you can. You don't want to be having paid a lawyer or spending your internal resources all the way to working in the contract and suddenly you realize that the, the risks they're asking you to take are not acceptable. Um, so due diligence of the vendor before buying is a, is a must do. Um, and this is part of what's typically referred to as vendor management. And a lot of laws out there, particularly in the financial areas, the health areas, uh, areas dealing with personal data, there are obligations imposed on you as the procuring organization to do vendor management. And that means knowing, knowing enough about them to know that they allow you to comply with obligations, but they also allow you to afford your donors, your members, your employees, the, um, the, the level of protection that they expect. Important to do what we call open reference checks. These are reference checks when the vendor is not really there with their other customer, the reference, and you, right? Those conversations are always very, uh, very rosy. You never get any, any real um, comment, any real feedback from the other customer. And we see a lot of customers doing uh, trial periods, or what we call POCs, proof of concept, um, conference room kind of pilots. It's okay to ask them to say, you know, I'm gonna, we sign a, a, a a little agreement on NDA. Let me let me really have my users get exposed a little bit to the system. Uh, let me actually um, figure out how easy it is to use. Let me take a, a run through the functionality over you know a month or two. Um, the other thing that um, nowadays has to be diligence, like almost without exception, is the disaster recovery and the the 
security protections that a vendor has in place. And typically you do that in a documentary fashion. You have to go in, in most instances and audit a company that you know likely has very good security, right? But uh, uh, but you do need to see whether they have SOC reports or they have other things that gives you a sense that, yeah, these this, this folks are have set themselves up pretty well. Another thing is if you are actually doing a material enough procurement and you do an RFP, uh, you can use the RFP to start asking for that information. Just don't ask only about the product, right? Tell me, can I do A, B, and C, and um, how much it's going to cost me? But really ask a lot of these things that will help you determine that the system is good, but the vendor is also good. And uh, and you can also use the RFP to say, you know what, um, the, the bidders need to uh, uh, agree with us in their response that they will provide sort of this kind of basic data protection uh, 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 commitments, this kind of service and performance commitments. So you're telling them, uh, you know, we expect you to do this when we get to contract. And that way you have the ability to know is there, you know, how hard it is to get them to, to be at the place where you want to be. Uh, another thing to think about in this pre-contracting process is um, most system providers, solution providers, are not going to guarantee today, they're not going to guarantee that their systems fully comply with the laws that apply to you. Um, for example, that it meets tax requirements, that it will always calculate pension benefits the right way, um, that it will always apply um, a sales tax if you have them you know, do a, a web store for you, um, or that will keep data in the way that the law is requiring you to keep it. You, you try for that and you get as close as you can, but they will almost always only agree to comply with the laws that apply to them, to the vendor. And of course, they're in a very different industry than you are, right? Um, so you need to figure out, uh, do I have enough commitment from the vendor to help me, enable me to meet my own regulatory obligations without getting that warranty? Um, and finally, there's also this, uh, this perception that, you know, you give the contract to the, to the folks in legal and they'll get you there uh, meeting your goal with exactly everything you need. And unfortunately, um, more, now more than ever, this kind of procurement requires your team as a whole to come in and participate. Um, you need the finance folks, the infosec folks, the development folks, the uh, the, the member facing or the, the liaison folks, right? Um, because everybody will have a stake in making sure that um, the solution meets the mission, meets the goal, while keeping it, you know, in the budget. Um, so, so, so that uh, an easy way, this next slide, I mean, gives you sort of the procurement continuum. Is the easier way when you're doing your next IT procurement, uh, go back to these three little buckets and, um, and you're going to need to have terms that, um, or a process that helps you get comfortable on each of them. And most of your negotiated contract terms will support one of these goals. First, your solution needs to be scrubbed, right? You need to validate that it is what you need. Uh, it has the right functionality, but more importantly, you also need to figure out what's not included. Um, we have a lot of instances where we do these big procurements just to find out that there were three modules that were in procure. And it's a lot easier to get good pricing and good terms to procure when you're doing it together as a bundle uh, than subsequently, right, when the vendor sort of, you're a captive audience now, so you're in. Um, and uh, one thing that um, we see time and again create issues, um, a tip for, uh, for you as a potential buyer, um, look closely at the order forms. So the vendor will give you a contract and, you know, legal is all over that, finance is all over that. Um, Look closely at the order form and what it includes. It will typically be a listing one through 13 of things with hyphenated cryptic names and only they know what they are, right? Uh, and it says you need 52 of this one, you need 10 of the other, and you pray that that is the right thing, right? So without exception, and we've seen that go really bad with some customers, uh, have to have to re-procure something uh, because they bought, they bought the version with a certain functionality, or a product that sounded similar but didn't have some of the added stuff. Um, so typically we recommend that you actually, uh, when you're reviewing that uh, order form, um, or even uh, when they describe it to you in the response to RFP, 
just reference the underlying documentation in the contract in the order say you know xyc kind of item number one i need 52 of those um, the documentation for this item the 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 features and functionality that are included um, are those that are set forth in the vendor documentation and specifications for it as simple as that uh, in some instance you may be able to reference a file name or have a link to where they are uh, the other function that that serves is that um, unfortunately happens a fair amount. Uh, sometimes you buy a version today that has everything you need. Um, the vendor, either because they got sold or they got more sophisticated or the product is getting too big, um, may very well either change the product name or divide up the product. Uh, so what you got as a full HR and benefits management um, uh, product, um, now may be divided in two. So you need to be able to point to something that says, no, no, but I, I'm going to keep what I have. I've already bought this. And uh, you're going to minimize the risk that the vendor is going to say, you know what, in order for you to keep getting benefits, you're going to have to re-procure them. It's another 30 grand, right? Um, so very important. The order is not just a necessary evil. It's really a very important legal uh, term. And um, uh, the 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 other thing on that first book is that you need to understand very well what it is you need to do to meet your uh, regulatory obligations and to implement and go live. You will always have a role in making sure that you get the end result properly done, um, particularly things like converting your data, determining what configurations you need to do, uh, what gaps exist in between what you need and what they have, how are we going to sort of fill those gaps. And um, and for that, you will always need to have a very comprehensive statement of work. And that is a legal document, too. You see many times when we're told, well, you're not going to see the statement of work. You're just going to see the master terms. Like, well, if I don't know what I'm procuring, what it takes and whatever, you know, I'm, I'm going to be only partially useful. Um, so, so you really, in order to be able to hold the vendor to a timeline, a budget, a scope, and the quality, you need to have a very good, very bedded um, scope of work. So on the second uh, pillar here, the contract is also your vehicle to ensure your vendor will perform. That's the lifeblood of the relationship, right? At some point you're alive, and, and so what, what do I do next, right? Uh, you want stability for a long time without material disruptions and minimize business impact. So you're going to have terms that we're going to talk about later regarding, you know, performance guarantees, service levels, um, the maintenance and support function. And finally, but critically, this contract will also be the vehicle for you to ensure that you control costs and that um, and that you protect your, your business information that this vendor is going to be exposed to. And every day we're advising customers on contracts that have terms, and you may have seen them, right? It says, well, the vendor may charge more, the assumptions are not true, or if it takes more time for me to do something, or if you call the headline too much or if you need more server space, or if your business or your members grow too much. And uh, without exception, you should push back, and you should either say, no, I want to buy something that actually allows, allows my nonprofit to grow. I mean, otherwise, I mean, that, that, that's exactly what I want to do. I want to grow, and I want you to grow with me. Um, I don't want to be nickel and dime if I have too many members, or if I merge another nonprofit with me, right? And now we, we, we have... Um, uh, more data to deal with. So you really need to vet that pretty carefully. And if you cannot eliminate it, then at a minimum, you should go ahead and, and put parameters around it. So uh, before Chris comes on the rest of my time with me, I'm going to take you quickly to three of this type of arrangements that we support a nonprofit group um, uh, colleagues a lot on, on your behalf. And the first one is uh, development arrangements. It doesn't matter what they're called, right? They, these are services agreements most of the time. But um, this is when you want an app that is, is, you're not using a vendor's existing app or a website, a calculator tool, a portal, a data warehouse. Um, for this, some of the key elements are uh, you will need to be very specific as to what you need created. You need to develop specification and requirements. And if it is an app, for example, uh, you'll need to figure out that you need to provide that the vendor will develop this uh, and will include all the necessary notices and um, icons and stuff to comply with the App Store requirements. Um, 
and you will need the right to test and accept the work. Uh, you never just take what they give you and hope it works. And you want to include a provision for knowledge transfer. You want to make sure they teach you how they build this, they show it to you, so you can take it over once their, their work is done. You will typically get a, a, a limited warranty uh, against errors or defects, and they will correct it. And you usually see 90, 60, 90 days period for this kind of warranty. Um, and um, the the thing about this this work, it's like a, it's a contract that begins and ends, right? Uh, this vendor will go away. They just created something for you and you're going to take it over. So what you need to think after you have somebody develop something is what, do you, what, what, what else do I need to enjoy the benefits of this new work? Um, you're going to need to have the work physically delivered to you. Um, usually you need to get, if it's a piece of software, an app, a portal, you need source code, you need technical do documentation so you can put it somewhere, compile it, and use it. Um, and if you don't have internally at your nonprofit the, the resources to do it, um, you may need to get a support agreement either with a vendor itself if they offer it or with a third party. There are people who do that. Uh, you also need to figure out where you're going to install and operate this, this uh, new technology you got. You may want to have it in your own cloud, a third party cloud, or you may want to put in your server closet that you have on your premises. Um, and the most important thing, you need to actually own this. You need to get a very broad right for you to take it over and do anything that the law allows to do with respect to that work. Um, and the way you do that, this is a, a big issue that we see many times where we're asked to look at documents that have already been signed. Um, the, there is no work for hire just because you paid $500,000 for a portal uh, or for um, a website. Um, it doesn't mean you own it. You have the right to use it. The, 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 the doctrine of work for hire does not attach to most contractor work. So you need a written assignment of all both things, the IP rights and all copies, this tangible item for this, um, for this particular development. That's going to be critical for that kind of, for this kind of uh, technology solution. This is the only one of the other two we're going to talk about now that really where it matters that you own um, that you own the solution. The next one is very typical. You all have some. It's license-based procurements, right? Uh, it involves you receiving a copy of the vendor technology in a way that has been configured for you, and, uh, and you can also have interfaces, right, between this system that they're licensing to you and another system you have, right? Um, DGL and the HR Connect and things like that. Um, you will need to have the data converted to work with this product. And, uh, and for all of that, you're going to need a real good statement of work. But what these folks are doing is really configuring for you. So for licenses and, and, and uh, for services that we're going to talk about in a few minutes, uh, what, what you really need to focus on initially is the scope of the license. The slides you're going to get have a lot more on scope of the license that you're going to be seeing here, but uh, but you do it's it's like a checklist. You really have to go and figure out what it is that is licensed to you, what can it be used for, for how long. Uh, you understand what are the user limitations. What is the name user for this vendor as opposed to the last vendor I bought something from, right? And the scope of the license, right? Um, means money. If you don't have sufficient right, the vendor will be happy to sell you more what you need, and it will cost you money that you didn't budget for. Um, so the second thing is that it's not development, so you don't get delivery of the source code. You get object code that can be compiled and installed. Um, and uh, the key to this relationship is that the vendor will continue to support and maintain it for you as long as you use it. So you have, a, you, you have the thing, you could have it on, you know, on your own server, but the, you need the vendor to fix it, to keep it evolving, to do regulatory updates. So one key item that we didn't talk about for development is that you're going to have to reflect in the contract uh, all of the commitments the vendor is making for maintenance and support. Uh, and it's, it's like three or four pillars for that, right? You're going to need support, uh, help this with good hours. Uh, if the vendor is in another jurisdiction and three hours away from you, well, starting support at 11 in the morning, your time is not so good. Um, they're going to have to fix errors, and you need to get an SLA, a service level agreement for that. How quickly are you going to acknowledge it? Are you going to categorize that? 
and how quickly are you going to target a resolution. If it's very critical and you define those levels, um, you're really going to need to um, say, you know, I want you to work around the clock with your engineering team to fix it because I am down. Uh, I'm in my fundraising season and my donor management system is down. So so that that, that requires severity one and 24 hours until you can give me a workaround or a, an actual fix. Uh, so that goes in your contract as well. And uh, the other thing that you need to worry about is that you need to get a commitment, as I mentioned earlier, that they're going to support the version you have for, uh, you know, even if it gets, if they've issued one or two other versions, you want to make sure they don't put you in a position where you have to change releases of versions every couple of years. Those things get sold to you. They're not included typically, and they cost money. Uh, so you need to understand where the vendor is on the product upgrade path. So you're not buying a version that's about to be obsoleted um, uh, by the end of this year, right? That, that's like a terrible thing to implement today. You should wait and see unless they're telling you you can keep that for at least uh, three years coming forward. And the warranty you get here is just going to be a limited warranty about your implementation. Your real remedy uh, is going to be that support operation. And uh, we always try to cap the pricing for, um, for support. Uh, it is very important that your support, which is typically, a, um, uh, it could be random too, right, but it's typically a percentage. Um, of what you pay for your software product for the license. Uh, right now you see 20 to 21 um, to 22 percent, so it's, it's not cheap. Um, but you want to make sure for the initial term, let's say the first three years, you're firm at that. Um, and then if you go on a year to year or a two year renewal terms, then you can put an escalator. We're seeing nowadays a lot of not to see 3 percent um, annually, but if you're paying a lot of money annually, 3% and you plan to use the system for another 10 years, it could end up being a tremendous amount of money. So you really need to model the, the cost of ownership over, let's say, the next 10 years. Uh, and um, so finally, the most common, the most prevalent um, um, sort of model for you buying the solutions that you need and um, your members and donors uh, want you to have is um, like what you call SaaS, right? Software as a service or hosted or the famous cloud, right? Cloud solutions. Uh, the difference uh, is similar in many ways uh, to what we talked about in terms of you still have somebody else's product, right? It's an existing solution. Um, and it will get implemented for you and configured by the vendor as well. Um, so you need statements of work and all of the same things we talked about. But here you're getting a little bit of an extra right. It's a right to access, not just to use. The platform because it's uh, it's sitting somewhere else. You 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 will not receive a copy of this product or solution, and um, the vendor is hosting it in its own servers or at AWS or um, Microsoft Azure, um, at Rackspace, and they're letting you access it to process your data, to operate some of your business functions. You know whatever the thing is for. Um, so your dependency in license on the vendor was to make sure you get that support in. Here, the dependence is to make sure the thing is actually up and available when you go to work every morning, right? When you're doing the batch or the reconciliation at the end of the month or the quarter of the year, when you're doing your fundraising, uh, when your main members are trying to do their learning management, their, their compliance courses, right? The thing has to be up and there's nothing you can do about it. It's all on the vendor. Um, so, um, so this is where some of the things you need to do here are more performance focused. Um, one of the trends we're seeing as the solutions become less expensive and, and more prevalent in the industry um, is a trend for the service providers not really wanting to negotiate the contract terms too much, uh, especially in the very high risk fi and financial areas, right? So it is truly a buyer beware environment. Uh, and this is where even Eating at the edge of some of the commitments to get a little bit more than the ba basic offering, knowing on what is market, what terms this vendor should be able to give you, becomes quite important. Um, some of the, um, the differences, um, that things that are unique for the service-based arrangement is, um, and you'll have a lot more on this, by the way, on the part of the slide deck at the end that you will not see today, you will see in the next day. Um, 
but you need a, co a good contract description of the hosting services. Um, for development, it was of the what to build. For the license-based things, when you're getting the software, it was mainly support and maintenance that you need the description. Here, you need to add on top of that a description of the hosting services. Um, what are these? These are their obligations to keep the technical environment. There'll be infrastructure. There'll be networks. There'll be telecom. There'll be firewalls. Uh, there'll be security layers and frameworks. Um, all of that they maintain, and you don't want them to have like a broken car back there, right? Um, we really need that to be uh, best practice for industry. So they'll need to keep and upgrade and keep scalable uh, that processing environment that they're making available to you. That merely means um, as I grow, I don't want to be on the same server capacity you gave me three years ago because now it's going to be really slow for your users, for your members to go through the portal, for the donors to donate, right? So you want this thing to be keeping up with, with the industry more. And um, you also want them to keep that infrastructure secure, to apply patches quickly, to do vulnerability testing. You also want to provide specifically, they will all have it, most of them, right? Um, but you want to provide that they will keep a disaster recovery policy and a site, and that means it could be that could be cold, warm, or hot, right? And uh, it could be something that immediately they have an interruption, it goes to the back end. It could be something that's processing a backup and a redundant operation at the same time as the the, the one you're using day to day, or it could be something that somebody has to go and trigger, right? But either way, you need to put all that on the contract, even if you know the vendor knows it. Um, a key part of this thing is the term. Um, the, um, this is a service. So these things are three to five years, maybe seven years uh, on the outside. Um, so the provisions that say, well, each of us will have the right to non-renew on 60 days notice, that's like a no good for you under, any, under most circumstances. Um, Nobody can move to a new system in 60 days. I, I don't care what it is, right? So you need to uh, uh, try for the following. One is say, uh, if I'm not in breach on the agreement before my initial term expires, um, I will have the right to unilaterally um, renew for the first two two-year period, so the first three one-year period. Uh, give yourself an option to renew so you create a renewal expectation. And there, uh, you don't, um, and then after that, it goes either party cannot renew. And then the second thing for that, you say, but well, you need to give me at least 180 days notice, right? You need the right to be able to go somewhere without having to put down your membership platform, right? Um, or your HR system. Um, this kind of contracts, um, uh, and, and on those renewal rights, by the way, always cap the pricing. Um, the other thing that's unique about this, we talk about having a service level agreement for your license-based technology. Here, you need a second set of terms on that. You need a performance uh, guarantee, a performance service level uh, metric that they're committed to. And that typically has to do with the thing will be up 24 hours, 24 by seven, um, except for the following things, like the schedule maintenance and maybe um, if we have a security threat and we, we must immediately to protect the integrity of the system, take it down. And then if they don't meet that, they will give you a little percentage of your fees back or usually as a credit. So that's also very unique to this kind of hosted environment and uh, but, but critical to it. And the final thing um, is that uh, you will need to include transition provisions. The vendor hardly ever includes them. So this is how your termination contract in the vendor template goes, right? So you say, uh, Terminate. We can terminate if either party breach on 30 days notice. Well, guess what? You you can't have anybody terminate you on 30 days notice. Absent some real horrible criminal thing that you're doing, you should have the right to get a time when they say you breach. We're going to terminate. You should put a couple of things there, right? To if there it is a disputed termination, to either continue the parties continue to perform and the uh, uh, subject to you know without them breaching, uh, waiving any remedies, right? If you really did something bad, they, they may be able to get damages from you. Second thing you put in is that uh, uh, even if you weren't able to cure and they terminate you, you really need to say, you know, but I, I, we will, I will continue. I have a transition period, let's say six months, nine months, depending on what it is, right, 90 days. So you can figure out where to go from there. And you also need to say that the vendor will assist you with the transition. 
uh, you will need to get your data out. You will need to make sure that um, the, uh, the logs and other things, for example, if you have a learning management system, the vendor is not just your data about who's taking these courses and who passed it, but it's also in the back end uh, data about um, making sure that it's, these are metadata, right? Data about data, logs and records, that they're important because they, they, they verify that in fact somebody went through the necessary clicks to, to finish the, the, or the test to finish the, uh, the, the certification course. Um, and the, one of the real key and very important distinctions of this kind of um, hosted arrangement is what Chris is going to walk us through for the remainder of the program. Uh, it has to do with the fact that contrary to development, contrary to when you have your software on-premise or in your own data, uh, your own cloud, you are giving the vendor your data for, for this kind of solutions. And, uh, and that's good, right? Many times you don't want to manage your databases. So this is perfect. You, you, you're going to migrate it there. You're going to convert it there. And they're hosting that for you. And that brings a whole new filter for disagreements. And you need to have an understanding of what role data is playing and what the risk is. So without uh, much ado, Chris, you want to take it over? Sure. Thanks so much, Noah. So as she said, the second half of this presentation is really going to focus on the data issues, uh, specifically data issues as they're present in these types of commercial contracts, uh, IT services, procurements, and software solutions. As you guys are probably well aware, uh, recent regulatory developments, both including this year and the past few years, have brought data issues to the center stage um, in this industry, in IT services and software as a service, and perhaps some of your existing suppliers and vendors actually have come to you looking to add an addendum or an amendment having to do with security procedures or regulatory compliance. Um, and there's a lot of diversity in the efforts of suppliers in this space right now to get ahead of the concerns. Uh, one of the main reasons being that uh, because there's not a lot of precedent for how these different types of regulations and new statutes are being enforced and how they're being investigated by the government, um, there is a lot of difference in opinion on the supplier side of how much they need to do, how far they need to go in order to comply with these new developments, and also what type of procedural obligations and legal liabilities they're willing to assume uh, as the statutory language, uh, excuse me, statutory landscape is changing. Um, one thing to note about data issues uh, straight from the very beginning is that even if the contract you're dealing with is not styled as a data services contract or the vendor that you're talking to does not describe themselves as a data services supplier, almost every software as a service or cloud hosted solution that you might procure today will have some kind of vendor exposure to data. Whether or not it's proprietary data that you yourself have been storing and are making available to this vendor as a part of the procurement itself, or data generated by your use of the services, and data that the vendor is collecting uh, as a result of um, metrics that are produced through your, your users and your members' access to their services. So that's why from the beginning I wanted to make a bit of a distinction here between what we could call data services, where the service provider is obviously processing, storing, or receiving, and in some cases collecting data on your behalf, where data is the product or the service, or something that they're doing to the data is the product or service that they're providing to you. And in that case, you should certainly hope that the supplier is being upfront with them, uh, with you, about their collection procedures, about their security protocols, because that's the industry space that they're operating in, that's the industry space that they present themselves to their customers as uh, they're being part of. But there's also data about the services, and this is true for all different kinds of vendors that provide technology solutions. Your access to these platforms is generating data. Your users and members access the credentials, the registration process um, that you're going through with any of these services is going to make data relevant whether or not the supplier acknowledges that they are a data services vendor. So that distinction is important, but I would say no matter which part you're operating in, whether it's the data service or the data about the service, you do need to pay attention to the data issues in these contracts, especially as this data becomes more and more valuable and more and more heavily regulated. Uh, personal data or PII or personally identifiable information, and there are many different types of statutory definitions or uh, terms that are used, but you guys have probably seen these terms, um, whether described in 
one of the contracts that you have with your supplier or a proposal or just discussed informally with a sales team. And everybody is concerned about personal data because there are a lot of different definitions that are present in the statutes. And this is the most sensitive and regulated or one of the most sensitive and regulated types of information. But all of your data is important. Uh, and there's data that is not necessarily going to fall under the statutory definition of personal data that is still valuable or that should still be kept confidential or that should be still treated with care. Um, and in a lot of ways, it's the contract's job to define this data effectively so that both parties know that you're not only concerned about what the statute specifically says the supplier should be taken care of, you have a broader view, especially when it comes to data that originates from you or your members. And that has to be worked into the contractual definition. On a similar note, there are a lot of IP issues that surface when it comes to the parties discussing the ownership and the licensing of data. And by that, I mean that traditional concepts in intellectual property that come from copyright laws, trade secret laws even, um, and certainly patent laws, are not always going to neatly apply to the party's business views of the value of the data, how the data should be kept secret, and who, quote unquote, owns and is licensing or receiving the right to use the data. <clears throat> in a lot of ways, uh, copyright especially, uh, which protects the expression of information, but or ideas that does not protect the information itself, and even trade secrets, even in a post-DTSA uh, federal trade secret law world, trade secret protection is very contingent on the party's practical, um, practical efforts to keep it secret, the perceived value of the information. And even though the parties may not dispute that information is very, very valuable, it may not always fall under the definition of a trade secret the way that the traditional view of trade secret law might view, uh, let's say, a, a recipe at a fast food chain, or some other secret type of process that is more obviously a business-oriented trade secret. So you have these masses of data that both parties have a really strong interest in either keeping confidential or being able to monetize on the vendor's part, uh, but there isn't really a vocabulary in IP statutes that catches up to the value of what you're discussing. And the long and short of it is, in the absence of a more specifically worded legal regime, you're really looking at data ownership as a creature of contract. A lot of times, despite the great amount of value, there's not really any legal, legal default rules of proprietary ownership that can kick in and protect data for you, which means that you always have to be very careful in every contract, and especially a contract for services with a for-profit vendor, uh, that involves your data. Because if you or any organization fails to describe data specifically in a contract and then hands data over without a lot of contractual procedures that apply to that data, they're sacrificing a lot of their proprietary claims to that data because so much of that is wrapped up in what they're saying and not saying in their contract. So the contract language itself, both the scope of the license that you provide to them and the obligations that you impose on suppliers to keep this information secret and sensitive and confidential, and especially uh, what the procedures and provisions say in this contract about what the supplier can and cannot practically do with this data uh, on a pure technical level, are all very, very important, not only in order to make sure that services are running smoothly from a data perspective, but also to safeguard your proprietary interest or your members' and users' proprietary interest in this data. And these contracts have to specifically describe the data itself, as I mentioned before, uh, and not just the personal information, but they also have to specifically describe what the supplier is doing. And there are a lot of different strategies to tackle this. You can make this very much an operational description in the SOW or the order form for a services procurement, or you could be upfront in one of the main legal provisions in the main body of the agreement and address and set forth all of these definitions that way. My preference actually would be to do both because it is that important from an ownership licensing perspective that the contract is very, very specific about what data is involved here and how these parties view it and treat it and the concessions they're making about the ownership of it for the IP-related reasons I described. Um, moving on to the second set of major uh, overarching issues. Always have to evaluate the required data consents and authorization. As you guys may have heard in other contexts, a lot of the current regulatory and statutory developments are focused on individual consumers, customers, and users, and their rights to privacy, which means that there are a whole host of uh, consent requirements of things that need to be obtained and um, affirmative acknowledgments 
uh, from the sources of these information, especially personal information. So whenever you're dealing with a vendor, consider how the flow of data is being represented in the contract and whether it's true to the business case. Where does this relevant data come from? Um, does it originate from a bunch of individuals? Does it originate from data that's stored on your services? Or, or your servers, excuse me? Does it come from the server of the service provider? And are they aggregating that data from another source? It could be a mixture of your proprietary data, the supplier's proprietary data, a third party's data. And the contract needs to be clear about this, and your procurement team needs to be clear about this as well, because the source of the data is increasingly important in today's environment. And every time um, a party starts working with data where they're not familiar with the source or they don't know whether it's been collected under the appropriate consent procedures, it ends up creating liabilities for both parties. Another related issue is whether or not these consents were collected, they may have only been collected from the individuals for a particular purpose at that time. And we see this a lot when you're dealing with older databases, collecting information uh, from members or individuals uh, over a long period of time, perhaps under a different initiative. You were taking a member survey or you were at an event and you collected a bunch of contact information specific to that event. And you do have to go back and do your diligence, uh, see what exactly you uh, disclosed to those individuals at that time and make sure that you don't have to go back and recollect consents now that you're considering onboarding this to a new vendor for a different type of processing purpose or making some kind of fundraising or uh, publicity use of this information that was not contemplated and more importantly not communicated to those individuals at the time that you collected it. And that goes double for suppliers who are providing you with data analytics, mailing list, uh, outreach strategies that involve third-party licensed data. You need to make sure that this contract involves a lot of important representations and warranties and liability-related provisions about that data because you don't have a lot of visibility into the sources of that data or the way that it was collected. And uh, the best way to protect yourself in that situation is to have a contract that says that the supplier is going to stand by the data that they're providing to you. And a lot of suppliers may are, are under the same kinds of operational pressures where they may not actually know um, how clean the collection pr um, process was for the data that they're monetizing by licensing it to you. And when you don't see a representation or warranty like that, or they are hesitant to go into an in-depth discussion of what those liabilities might look like, it signals to you in some ways that they have these concerns about their own database, similar to concerns you may have about yours. Uh, and in both sides, representations and warranties take center stage here, and uh, they can result in liabilities for both parties. A vendor who's handling your data will often look for some kind of promise from you that the data has all the consent and was collected in compliance with all applicable laws and regulations. And if you can't make that warranty, you certainly shouldn't include it in a contract for services, even if you think these services are routine or you feel like uh, the data involved is not that sensitive. The liability can be real because it's very process oriented about the collection. And again, even more important on the other side that you collect these warranties from, um, from suppliers who are either commingling your data with other data and providing a report to you or licensing data directly to you from some outside source. Uh, similarly, and this is especially relevant in the space that many of you operate in as nonprofit organizations and associations where there may be special regulatory reporting requirements that apply specifically to your industry sector, your segment, um, or your members, that suppliers who are operating in a lot of different types of industries, who provide more generic services that are not specialized towards a nonprofit sector, for example, may not be aware of. So in this case, especially for those who know that they have special types of audit limitations or reporting requirements um, that are a part of uh, your nonprofit status or a part of the industry, you need to bring those things up front with your vendor because they may provide, be provided to you a standard offering with standard security, standard reporting obligations um, that isn't a good fit for what your organization specifically needs them to provide. And a lot of times they are willing to make these concessions on a technical level, but they won't be providing those to you up front as an option. And in that case, you need to go on offense a little bit and bring these issues up with them. Similarly, uh, there are a lot of regulatory exemptions in the nonprofit space, as many of you may have heard, perhaps in another seminar or from your own personal research. The uh, CCPA, which is the big California privacy statute that came into effect this year, uh, does include a very helpful exemption for many of your organizations due to its focus on for-profit actors. 
But do note that, especially those of you who have uh, entity members that are for-profit companies, the CCPA exemption may not be so broad as to capture all of your membership as well and all the data that they may be providing to you. And especially if the vendor collects data for you, you need to be sure that they are representing and warranting, as I mentioned before, but also following a procedure that complies with an increasingly specific number of laws, uh, things like uh, reporting to you when they receive a request for a takedown and all of these other things. And these will often be the subject of a specialized addendum. Um, many of you may be familiar with the GDPR, the European style addendum that uses very specific terminology like processor, controller, um, it has a, a series of uh, statutorily mandated default provisions uh, and exclusions in it. Um, and we're seeing many, many more variations of that type of language in each new procurement as the vendors become more and more sensitive to the procedural requirements that are now being imposed on them um, in certain situations. So please do take a look out on those. Uh, Cross-disciplinary hey, issues, um, this is similar I'm to what to... Oh, please go ahead. Yeah, I'm going to interrupt a second for a housekeeping matter that goes at this part of the presentation for speak for the audience. The CLE code for today's uh, presentation is capital T technology, capital T technology. Thank you, Chris. Uh, please go ahead. Sure. Um, and really quickly, because Nora already mentioned it, this is very much a cross-disciplinary issue. This should involve input from your IT or network security uh, professional and also hopefully uh, with your insurance or risk management personnel um, because a lot of the liabilities that are wrapped up here and the evaluation of the vendor's ability to actually comply with their obligations in the space is going to go hand in hand with, let's say, your network security professional's evaluation of their audit report that they have provided one um, or their general understanding of how the insurance covers uh, all the liabilities that you guys are describing. So moving on to this next slide, it's a bit long. I'll try to go through it quickly. So we're going to talk about some very common provisions um, that you'll be seeing in these types of contracts that are specific to data, uh, some of which we've discussed previously, such as defining customer data and asserting ownership of customer data. I, was, I just wanted to include this again because it is very important that your contracts contain a separate provision that specifically describes these things. But as I mentioned before, there is no default definition of these terms from statute that's going to kick in and save you if you haven't defined it carefully in this context. Uh, similarly, you should be looking at establishing practical standards for data security and uh, network protection. Um, when it comes to how you establish these standards, many vendors are going to be hesitant to describe an industry standard under the excuse that there is no industry standard, the industry is too new, the law is developing too quickly. Um, so a lot of times this is going to be a very technical discussion, similar to what I mentioned a moment ago, saying that your IT uh, input needs to be involved here. Uh, so a lot of times the, the parties will be referring to a specific type of technical standard when it comes to evaluating or auditing their security procedures, or even referencing statutory definitions, um, especially for terms like personal information or for the things like the amount of time that they have to uh, provide you a notification of security breach. Um, do you specify where your data will be stored? Uh, there are a lot of potential issues, uh, regulatory compliance issues with international storage in different types of countries. So if it's possible for you to get your vendor to promise that they're going to do domestic storage only, that will only be helpful for you. Uh, to the extent that they do have an extensive subprocessor network that requires them to ship data overseas when they're performing these services, I do recommend um, making sure there's a separate term in this contract that ensures their legal compliance when uh, doing cross-border data transfers. Um, the vendor data license, again, goes back to the importance of the contract stating the parties' rights about data. Uh, their ability to use data for purposes unrelated to your services uh, needs to be expressly spelled out here. A lot of vendors operate under the assumption that they're okay with using aggregated data metrics or other types of secondary data derived from your data and the processing of your data. And especially if the data is very sensitive or it comes from your members and you have limited amounts of permissions, you need to take a careful look at the license provision that is specific to data here to see exactly what types of other uses these vendors are permitting in their standard forms. And to push back too, even on things like aggregated or anonymized data and making sure that the procedures that they're using to anonymize this data are things that you're comfortable with, 
or in certain cases saying even for aggregated and anonymized data, you're not comfortable with them using it for anything other than the specific provision of services uh, at that time. Return of destruction of data is a very important um, operational provision. There are going to have to be specific procedures and timeframes for this return and destruction. You need to make sure they're giving you enough time to retrieve the data from their servers for those externally hosted solutions. Um, and also consider whether or not certain liability provisions and certainly confidentiality protections will survive this return, destruction, and termination of the contract. Uh, the vendor is often going to rely on third-party subcontractors, certainly for hosting. Uh, a very large number of these suppliers are operating under an AWS procurement or a Google Cloud hosting or Microsoft Cloud environment. And um, you need to make sure that whether it's hosting externally or subcontractor processing, that there are a lot of good provisions in place, both that give you visibility into the identity of the subcontractors that they're using, and also uh, ensure that they're not going to disclaim liability simply because um, they have a third party working on these services, especially from a hosting perspective. Uh, compliance with data laws and regulations, we mentioned that already, uh, that you do need to be vocal about raising these issues with them. And the vendor may actually argue with you because a lot of these laws are new, that certain statutes and regulations don't apply to them or don't apply to you or don't apply to these services. And that can be a nuanced discussion, but it's always helpful to ensure that the vendor takes, or rather the contract takes a expansive view of the vendor's liability for and representations and warranties about their violations of law uh, when it comes to providing services to you. And in situations like the one that we're operating in in this legal environment, uh, a lack of knowledge about the implications of the law should not be an exemption um, to their obligation to comply with it. Uh, vendor assistance to compliance with laws. Um, this can be a tricky situation. It most often comes up in security breach situations where you are, or rather the vendor has had a security breach that resulted in the unauthorized disclosure of your data. And then uh, there's a question of, who's responsible for paying out the expenses for notifying the individuals who are affected. But it can cover other types of compliance as well, such as um, when one of the parties receives a request for a takedown of individual information that's being stored on either party's servers and all of these things. And there should be both a procedural element in the contract to describe those scenarios and also an expense allocation as well. Uh, some vendors will, again, be operating under the assumption that they will participate in these activities, but they'll be doing it at your cost and expense because it's, quote, unquote, your data, um, whereas others have that baked into the fees for services, and that's something that you need to look, take a look at. Um, insurance is something that, unfortunately, we won't have a lot of time to cover today, but it's very, very important uh, for, again, for you to have a dialogue with uh, your insurance professional or your risk management expert uh, to see the extent to which you guys have coverage uh, covering your own data uh, on an organization level, but perhaps more importantly, what the, the, uh, the supplier is saying in their contract about the type of policies that they have. Um, disaster recovery, business continuity, again, uh, Laura touched on some of the SLA and support uh, type of provisions in these contracts. Um, this is very much about a technical evaluation uh, by your IT professional, but I also recommend taking a look at um, the hard legal obligations when it comes to uh, server failure, when it comes to the recovery of data, a lot of these standard contracts are actually going to upfront say to you, you don't have any, we assume no liability, we have no obligation to store your data in the long term, and you need to have your own disaster recovery protocols in place. And if that's true and you're comfortable on a technical level, having taken care of that on your own, that's fine, but there shouldn't be some unspoken expectation outside of what the contract specifically says that in the event of an emergency or a disaster, they're going to reproduce this for you because I promise you that if the contract doesn't specifically say that, they're not going to be interested in doing that for you. Um, and then uh, we already mentioned the SLA and warranty concerns throughout. And the, again, the data processing addendum that I mentioned before, uh, CCPA you may not be seeing as much because there's this assumption of exemption for you in the nonprofit space, but uh, there are going to be um, some GDPR related agenda that you may see if EU citizens are involved or other general security provisions that your suppliers are putting into an addendum rather than the main body of the contract. And each of these need to be reviewed to make sure they comport with uh, processes and especially timelines that are workable for you. 
And then the last slide we're going to go over on data is about the interaction with confidentiality. Um, and confidentiality and information security are typically segregated into two different sections that are separate but very related. And both are necessary unless they're consolidated into a single section. Um, the confidentiality section is one you may be very familiar with even in less technical services procurement scenarios. Uh, and even though a lot of the terminology may be familiar to you, disclosing party, receiving party, definition of confidential information, um, you shouldn't overlook this. It becomes very, very important to understand the overlap between the general obligations in the confidentiality section and the data section um, that may describe the more specific practical procedures and security requirements. Uh, the, there are a lot of different ways to tackle this, but um, defining confidential information is really important to specifically include whatever you've described as your data, especially personal information, as your confidential information. Because sometimes these contracts are going to be treating them as totally separate ideas, and a lot of the assumptions about confidentiality that you think are protecting you in the confidentiality section or a pre-existing NDA are not going to fall under the definition of confidential information that you've, um, that you've established here when it comes to your data. And making sure that those links are made explicit in the contract is very, very important to make sure that both sets of protections apply. Um, so as a result, uh, the information security procedures are going to be a lot more um, practical often as they're described in these contracts. They're going to be specific procedures for notice, cooperation, remedy, in the event of security breach. Uh, defining the security breach is extremely important. Um, again, you have the reference to technical standards and audit procedures that you use to establish the thresholds for the type of protocols that they need to follow. And then um, you have the expenses. Uh, so some suppliers will take the position that even though they'll notify you about the problems that have, when it comes to liabilities arising from those problems and third party liability, they're kind of hands off and it's at your own risk. And you really want to push back against that because in most services scenarios, um, the amount of fees that uh, you're paying them are not going to be commensurate to the potential liability of a serious security breach. And you want to make sure that your vendors are standing behind their systems infrastructure uh, when they're making these representations to you and that they have either their insurance or some generous liability cap amount that stands behind that as well. And that leads us into, again, indemnification, which is always a very hot topic in this space. Do note that uh, vendors are going to be very sensitive about trying to exclude these types of liabilities from their general liability cap. Um, they're going to be aggressive about their assertions that they make about their insurance and uh, the procedures that they need to follow. Uh, and you just need to be aware that unless these exclusions exist in your contract, the vendor is going to do everything they can to escape liability for a, a worst case scenario. Um, and there are a lot of different ways. The last thing I'll note is on liability, which is a lot of different ways to approach uh, the liability cap question. Um, many times uh, the vendor is going to simply say, uh, we have a broad cap of liability for all different types of indemnities and all different types of contract claims, um, typically expressed as uh, 12 months fees or six months fees. Um, the idea for you, of course, is for that to be uncapped or be to reference the full insurance policy. And then there are a lot of different ways to try to meet in the middle here, but it needs to be a conversation with your business team about the fee value of the contract and the sensitivity of the data, especially. Um, there are super caps, which are hard amounts of money that are far in excess of the fees. Uh, multipliers of the fees that uh, kind of are an acknowledgement that the amount of fees being paid shouldn't be the floor for this type of liability and that they need to have something like six times that amount of fees. And again, references to the insurance that the supplier may have, um, especially the strategy of having you named as an additional insured under cyber liability policy can go a long way in providing the protection that you need. I think that brings us to the end of our time. Um, so, Nora, I don't know if you had any closing remarks. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you, Chris, and thank you, everyone. Uh, we got a few questions on the <coughs> chat box. We will be reaching out separately to you on those. Uh, if there's an interest in any of these particular topics of so the further information you'll see on the on the slide deck, uh, if there's enough interest, let us know. We may be able to do some more focused kind of section, a session in the future on some of this. Uh, specific topics. In the meantime, uh, please everyone stay healthy and safe. And thank you for joining us today on behalf of the whole Venable team. Goodbye, everyone.